Hello. Yeah. You can hear me well? Okay. Um, yeah, so hi everyone. Yeah, my name is Anel. And uh, yeah, today I'll talk about our journey at AWS Nitro Hypervisor of working towards upstream first approach. And yeah, like my part in that is trying to reduce downstream kernel patch footprint. But yeah, first things first. Uh, I'm a software engineer, kernel hypervisor engineer in the EC2 Accelerated Nitro organization. Uh, and basically, my team owns the hypervisor for Nitro. And we also do slightly more um, stuff like engineering parts, so beyond the hypervisor in the uh, accelerated computing. So instances that have yeah, GPUs, FPGAs, and some custom accelerators that we have at AWS. Yeah, and thanks for the great drawing. Um, I thought it's like a really nice one to uh, introduce myself. Um, yeah, and I'm based in Berlin, yeah, and work in this team. My first time at Kernel Recipes and first time giving this talk as well. So I'm very curious about like um, hearing what people are interested about. And if you have any feedback in the end, I would also re really appreciate if you like share it. Yeah, so what am I going to talk about? Uh, just kind of give like a very high, high level uh, overview of the Nitro Hypervisor. Then, yeah, basically talk about why do we even have the downstream patch set? Why did it grow? And why are we trying to reduce it now? Um, yeah, basically what's there? And um, yeah, finally, kind of in the end, what do we see as the long-term vision and what we're trying to do um, going forward? Um, yeah, so as you may have guessed, Nitro Hypervisor, it's called Nitro Hypervisor because it's inside AWS Nitro uh, subsystem. So the basic thing, like kind of the major thing that we did differently is that we took networking and block storage out of the hypervisor and it actually lives on dedicated hardware and other software component, uh, components uh, deal with it. Like uh, for EC2, it's ENA and EBS. And the Nitro hypervisor, um, yeah, basically uses the Linux kernel and KVM module for virtualization. Um, yeah, so what are our priorities, right? Uh, obviously, we want to stay secure, and a lot of our customers also care about staying compliant. Um, for developers, we obviously want to have newer uh, features from upstream. And yeah, all of that, obviously, we want to do really fast and never regress. So how do we achieve those things? Um, yeah, to staying compliant, right? One of the obvious things that we should do is uh, ingest all the stable updates. So any minor releases for the kernel version that we're running on, we should ingest them as soon as possible. And uh, yeah, we had a great talk from Greg that talks about, right, if you want to stay secure, just ingest all the stable updates. Um, yeah, and for the newest features from upstream, obviously we want to do that as well. Uh, and to stay as close as up, uh, to upstream, you would want to do major kernel upgrades. So jumping from uh, like, yeah, a um, major version. Um, it could be, like, in our case, we pick long-term stable kernels. Um, yeah, and all of that, to do that really fast, you have to do rebases fast. Yeah, and we're not doing anything, like, super revolutionary with our rebases. Basically, yeah, we pick some LTS release, uh, then take our downstream commits and apply them on top, right? And then uh, we, like, test them, if there are any bugs, we fix them and then deploy. Yeah, and usually the testing, um, it's uh, fairly like we understood how long it's going to take. So for minor releases, it would be on the lower end, maybe one to two weeks. And if we're doing a major upgrades, like we take at least four weeks to do more comprehensive testing. And uh, deployment in our case is also not a big problem because uh, like since day one, we wanted to do live updates in production. So we basically, you can think of it as live migrating uh, VMs from the same host to the same host, right? So you just serialize your VMs, you uh, update the kernel, and then on, and you can update the whole hypervisor, right, including the user space components. <clears throat> and then you deserialize them uh, after the live update. So this part actually is not the bottleneck in our process, like testing and deployment. Yeah, but the rebase nowadays uh, will take over a year, and we have to now dedicate 
uh, multiple engineers to do it, right? Uh, and they have to do it full time. Yeah, and obviously we, um, yeah, so if you try to kind of show it a bit more true to scale, um, the rebase would take much more. Um, yeah, but if you have a minor update, usually rebase is not that hard. So, um, yeah, here maybe the time would be a bit shorter, but all of that is to say that rebase is actually not an uncommon operation for us, and we want to do it fast. So, yeah, um, hard lesson learned, rebase is hard, uh, and now because we have a big downstream uh, patch set, it is slow, uh, obviously error prone. Sometimes, yeah, you can just resolve the merge conflicts manually, like in the wrong way, and yeah, then like later we would catch it, but it's more difficult actually when something applies cleanly, but then, um, yeah, you, you don't even review it, and you only notice it once you start testing on hardware. And finally, uh, we don't hire engineers just to rebase stuff. Like, we always hire just kernel hypervisor engineers and people that could have been, like, writing new features or debugging some customer uh, issues. They have to do this work. So, yeah, you would probably ask, why do we even have it? Why does it take more than a year? So, kind of, over time, uh, the first Nitro instance was uh, launched in 2017. And then, yeah, this is kind of like over the years how it grew. And then, yeah, we didn't really do much with it, but basically we got to a number of like around a thousand patches. Yeah, so in 2023, we decided, hey, this number is very big. Maybe we should do something about it. And yeah, I got this very easy project, right? Uh, so that's basically what I work on. And uh, yeah, the goal is to like be very aggressive and try to remove it, um, yeah, and do something about it. So I've been doing some stuff, so we got to remove it. But uh, yeah, as you can uh, see, it's not going like super, uh, like the slope is not very big. Uh, but yeah, for 2025, we want to be like super aggressive and continue this work, and we want to maybe like try to get it to a point where it's um, half the size. Yeah, so in the beginning of the year, I just basically started looking at all of our patches. It, like the patch that was a bit abandoned uh, and yeah, tried to kind of look at uh, different categories of why things stay downstream. So a lot of the patches were kind of to deal with some peculiar hardware uh, that we have uh, in the Nitro ecosystem. And then some of them also, like sometimes we introduce workarounds that could have been fixed elsewhere, like for example in firmware or BIOS, but those components are non-life updatable, but we still want to patch the, um, and like improve the experience for customers that are still running on those uh, old, uh, with that old firmware or BIOS. So we add like extra workarounds downstream. Uh, yeah, some of the patches were, you know, we tried to upstream it, but then kind of got rejected. We still kept it to still kind of fix an issue for ourselves. A lot of the times we just kind of were like, okay, let's uh, implement something downstream now, but didn't really understand how and like for what use uh, we would try to upstream it later on. And yeah, finally, like uh, just some stuff for like debugging, collecting some additional data. This is meant to be just temporary. But the last category is like a very sad one where people were just built on top of already downstream features. So it's hard to make the case to um, like, yeah, upstream that without upstreaming the prerequisite. Um, yeah, so this is kind of a flame graph of all the stuff that touches, like all the files that are touched by downstream patches. Uh, not surprisingly, kind of the, a lot of the stuff is in the KVM, uh, like KVM directories, right? Uh, a lot in um, x86 and ARM, since those are the two architectures we support. Uh, some stuff lives in like our own directory, Amazon. Uh, those are like probably not upstreamable, and also like quite a few patches in the IOMMU uh, PCI part, and those. Uh, like funnily enough, right, we have the life update that allows us to, to deploy stuff really fast, but at the same time, that's what actually makes rebases hard because we keep some of that code uh, downstream to just make the life update possible. 
Uh, and yeah, last thing I want to say about like the composition of the patch set. Um, yes, yeah, so this is from 2023 up until 2024. Uh, actually, a big chunk of the patches are uh, backports from newer kernels, right? But we don't actually like think of them as maintenance uh, because usually, right, like after a kernel upgrade, they're gonna go away. And for the rest, we try to categorize whether that's something that should be upstream versus uh, something that probably is kept uh, best downstream. So roughly half of the patches are probably will always stay downstream. We will have to uh, always like maintain it downstream. But the rest actually, like, you know, there could be more users that would want it as well. So from that patch that is upstreamable or maybe upstreamable, um, yeah, a big part of it is related to life update. So, I mean, here I put it as a separate category, right, life update. Uh, but uh, guest MFS, IOMMU persistence would be uh, kind of related. And I'll talk a bit more about it uh, in the next slides. Uh, we also have a Hyper-V VSM, another project. Uh, right now we are trying to upstream secret hiding, a few changes in the scheduler, and then kind of like one miscellaneous category with smaller patch series that could be um, looked at individually. Yeah, so what have I been doing this year? Right, first, like I try to do the kind of low-hanging fruit and just look at the patches that we could just drop, right? So there were a few examples where we kind of just built something but then never launched in production and then it really like didn't look like anything useful for anyone. So we like developed it and just forgot about it. So that was easy. Uh, then another thing is um, for downstream patches, yeah, we keep them as like good patches and sometimes we just create them like out of a commit, right? But if you are basing something all the time, you would probably want it as a nice patch series. So I just did like a bit of uh, like massaging with the patches so that they look like nice, uh, like feature series. Uh, yeah, and then another one, like something we deal with a lot is like hardware vendors would come to us and then report the, about like a security vulnerability. And then we kind of have to develop a mitigation uh, in parallel to upstream because by the time the embargo would lift, we would already need to like have the fix either, um, yeah, probably like deployed already everywhere. Or by the time, yeah, like upstream uh, has a solution, we would need to like uh, be ready to deploy. So yeah, at that time, basically that's something we will always have to deal with. But yeah, another kind of sad part is obviously we're not running the like latest, newest kernel. Um, and sometimes we just kind of have bugs that were already solved in newer kernels, but uh, we would have to fix it like somehow else because um, yeah, taking like backporting, sometimes it would involve backporting a lot of patches just to fix kind of like a one-liner thing. So yeah, we have to create some downstream patches for that. And finally, that was a fun one. There was also uh, one a series of patches that we kept just to kind of support one generation that was um, launched maybe like m many years ago. And it was running with old firmware and just for that like one small inst uh, instance type and like only on spe spe special uh, old firmware, <clears throat> sorry. Yeah, we were keeping like this uh, patch series, but then basically, yeah, we went to the hardware engineering teams and we said, can you just like retire these hosts? And they said, fine. And basically, yeah, they left, migrated VMs, and then rebooted and rebuilt the host, and we didn't have to deal with this problem anymore. Oh, oops. So yeah, with this kind of exercise, you know, almost uh, like I could drop almost 100 patches. So 80 was like actually remove them from the patch set, and 18 was like, yeah, trying to find equivalent fixes or features upstream. Uh, so that means with a new kernel upgrade, we wouldn't have to take them forward. But yeah, but basically with the rest, um, yeah, like you can't do this to all the features and patches you keep downstream. So the best thing you can do is obviously upstream. And yeah, we like a lot of my colleagues also um, are working on this and I'll like, I will give just quick summaries about it, but probably if you're really uh, interested in like knowing all the details, uh, reach out to them or like look at the RFC series they posted. 
But yeah, basically one of the great features we have is life update. Uh, but if you want to do it in production on your systems right now, you would experience problems, right? If you just try to k-exec into the new kernel, but still have your VMs run on the system. Yeah, the biggest problem is that the new kernel is gonna overwrite like the data that you're trying to save from the old kernel, and you would want to save some things. Um, yeah, so for example, yeah, like if you think of it as, again, like migrating VMs to the same host, at least you would want to keep the metadata of like where you serialized your vCPU states, stuff like that. Um, we also keep IOM and page, page tables in place, so we also preserve those. Um, yeah, so one of the like frameworks that uh, Alex Graf created is the kernel um, uh, kexec handover, KHO. And basically this kind of gives you the ability to pass almost like arbitrary um, data over kexec. And then, um, like another colleague of mine, uh, James, he wrote, on top of that, he wrote this like, ability to per uh, persist RAM in the file system and then pass it over KHO. Um, yeah, and just with that, you can already do like some, uh, you know, like you can already do life updates with VMs. Um, and yeah, to kind of further uh, built on top of that, right, you would also want IOMA new page tables and then keeping VFs alive over KXF. So why did it take so long for us to upstream it? The thing is, like, when we were developing it, this is one of the examples where things were just built on top of each other. And our downstream implementation was just doing everything at once. And even, um, I'm going to talk about secret hiding later on, like downstream, the same feature is trying to do that as well. Um, yeah, so it was really hard to just like take this blob of like um, several hundred patches and just try to upstream it because things were like doing too many things and not, there was not a clear separation of functions. Uh, but yeah, that's what we're trying to do now. Uh, another one, this one is Hyper-V VSM. That's actually something I worked on, so I could talk a bit more about it. Uh, and I worked on the downstream implementation. So if you, don't, if you know anything about VSM, uh, or don't know, like, in the basic kind of very high-level view, basically you want, you, you know that you're running uh, as a VM on, in the cloud, and you want your hypervisor to protect, uh, like, some information uh, from your own kernel. Uh, or, yeah, and that feature is called, like, credential guard. And another one, code integrity, you can also, like, make only certain binaries executable. And all of that is done by... Um, yeah, basically marking certain pages as no access read only or non-executable for the non-privileged trust level. And yeah, in this example, we were like trying to meet the customer commitment really fast, but we also wanted to upstream it. Uh, so it, we, we were kind of trying to uh, choose a solution that would work. Uh, and yeah, I'll talk a bit more about like what we started with and what we ended up with. And we presented it first um, at the KVM forum last year. <clears throat> Yeah, and what happened with the project is that, you know, for the upstream, we had to completely redesign it. So if in the first implementation, a lot of the stuff was in KVM, um, yeah, and the latest revision, like almost everything is in user space. Um, yeah, and the problem with the first revision is what was like very intrusive code going into like things that really don't care about Hyper-V and VSM. Uh, and uh, now, yeah, we're basically taking it all out. But uh, the interesting concept that came out of it is that in the like new implementation, each VM could have multiple KVMs attached to it. And then you would do scheduling from like VCPUs of different uh, KVMs from user space. So if you're interested in, like if it sounds interesting to you, also take a look. Uh, my colleague also presented it <coughs> uh, at the KVM forum just a few days ago. Um, yeah, so here, obviously, the pro like, we have a big problem here because uh, like our downstream implementation is so different that we'll have to also rewrite user space to use it. But uh, yeah, so obviously, the, the lesson learned would be really great to at least agree on the user space API before like, doing the full-blown implementation. Uh, but at the same time, like with this specific example, it was very ambiguous. Like We didn't even know that the first design would work until we had it all implemented. And the thing with Windows, like it wouldn't boot until you have everything uh, set there. 
So yeah, we only like realized all the downside while implementing um, while implementing it. Yeah, and the last one I want to talk about is secret hiding. So this one is interesting for all the like hypervisors that are uh, yeah basically trying to solve against the speculative execution attacks. So how we solve it downstream? We basically unmap guest memory from the host kernel uh, address space. And yeah, because a lot of the attacks are based on the fact that, yeah, like the physical memory is available in the host kernel address space, and then you do some manipulations and uh, like snoop on the stuff that gets loaded in caches. Yeah, so one thing, um, yep, another colleague of mine, Patrick Roy, uh, presented at the LPC. Yeah, it's basically unmapping the guest memory from the host kernel's direct map. Uh, it's building on top of guest memory. And another one uh, is hiding VCP register state, kind of doing the same thing, but uh, with the registers. Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> um, yeah, and with this one, it was a little sad. I actually looked at like the patches from um, a while ago that we just had downstream. And in that case, we immediately, like as soon as we were developing, we posted it. We got some feedback, but we just never followed up. But uh, yeah, this was something that, you know, like opportunity missed. And yeah, why do we care about it now? Uh, and like, what are we doing about it? Obviously, we want to do better. And uh, also, yeah, we learned the lesson that it's best to work uh, upstream first. And uh, the features we develop downstream usually like somebody else also like can find the use case. Um, those are not like we're not the only ones trying to solve uh, problems like this. Uh, yeah. So from the chart that I showed you, we already yeah like trying to find the path for these projects. Uh, IOMU, uh, IOMU persistence like for the page tables that's gonna come after getting the like getting agreement on the KHO and the guest manifest. Uh, scheduler stuff, we also, yeah, trying to look at, like, what the recent uh, proposals are for, uh, like, dealing with the overcommitted platforms and miscellaneous, right? Like, we're also looking at how we can make it into nice uh, series. Yeah, but we also have success stories in the Nitro Hypervisor. Uh, this is a Zeno Nitro project uh, led by, like, we have a team for it, and the engineers that led it is, are uh, David Woodhouse, <clears throat> Uh, and Paul Duran. Yeah, and basically this adds like the opportunity to run Zen guests on KVM. And why did we care to do it? Is uh, actually EC2 started with the Zen hypervisor, and a large part of our fleet was still running on Zen. And you always have these customers that just don't don't want to migrate. They don't want to change anything in their workloads. And basically, right now, what we do in production, we actually take those Zen guests. And on reboot, we migrate them to Nitro. Uh, and uh, now, yeah, you basically, you can do it also on upstream uh, Linux. And even, yeah, there is like QEMU support for it. Yeah, so, yeah, what is the ultimate recipe for us? Yeah, it's very hard to obviously be like upstream first and still commit on all the uh, commitments that you make to customers, right? But Kind of the Zeno, looking at Zeno Nitro, their recipe was uh, post an RFC for the initial design and try to get some feedback. Um, then probably at that point, that's where you want to create the full implementation and you start uh, reviewing it downstream. <clears throat> yeah, and also you want to show the full implementation and then like get critique in upstream. Um, yeah, and then. Basically, you try to like get it merged, and hopefully, you get at least like partial, perhaps full implementation merged upstream, and yeah, maintain help maintain upstream implementation, and then downstream, uh, you could either just wait for the next kernel upgrade to get it, or actually like go on and remove the old one and backport the implementation back. So yeah, hopefully with this work, you know, like, I really hope that in a year from now I can come and say, okay, I was successful and now we're at like a very small number of patches downstream. Hopefully that can help us run newer kernels earlier and then we would also be able to test 
um, newer kernels in our big uh, Nitro fleet and fix bugs and contribute more upstream, right? So uh, it's kind of like helping itself, right? Once we have a smaller patch set, then it will be easier to rebase and easier to stay up, uh, closer to upstream. Yeah, so this is all for me. Uh, thank you very much, uh, yeah, for listening to me. Yeah, and if you have any questions, please. Um, yeah, yeah. So the question was how many people are like in my team? It's a little hard to uh, like tell the exact number, but yeah, in, like we have a brilliant office. Um, yeah, maybe the whole, like the team I am immediately in is like seven people, but we work specifically on the yeah, like kernel rebasis, uh, patch reduction, and then like yeah, dealing with like CVEs and so on. Um, and there are more teams. I mean, I can tell you, yeah, like I don't know the exact status for those, but we have a team for like platform enablement, right? Those are like new generation of different CPUs. Then there is a team for specifically like life update and life migration. Um, and we have a big, like a bigger org that, yeah, I mentioned, they work on the accelerated computing instances. So they do like a bit more than just the hypervisor. They like help other teams bring up the new platforms and then also maintain it. Yeah, like maybe it gives you a rough size, yeah, not sure. Oh, we also have instance features. Yeah, I forgot. It, those are like different features, like TPM, Secure Boot, uh, Enclaves, Nitro Enclaves, um, yeah. So, yeah, my question was two-folded. Uh, what did, you, you were speaking about old kernels and recent kernels. Do you have an idea of what other version you are using in productions? And uh, the side question is, what puts you in a position if I understood well your, your graphs of having a thousand patches to be cherry picked, does it mean you are not using uh, the, uh, the dot releases? Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, we always have kind of like a two, two kernels that like one is running in production and another one is uh, like being scheduled for update. So um, yeah, like I think from the six, six, the LTS was six, six, right? So that's the one we're basically like uh, trying to run on next or soon, right? Um, yeah, the, like the one that was previous, not sure. And what, what do you have this amount of upstream cherry picks? Um, yeah, I mean, that I can't explain exactly. Yeah, we just basically like cherry pick for different features. Uh, a lot of them are like for new CPUs. So if like Intel or AMD just add like some support for their like new generation CPUs, usually those come to like upstream master, right? And then we take those. Um, yeah, and sometimes people just take optimizations. Yeah, but I think, yeah, with like upgrade to 6.6, a lot of them should go away. Thank you. Uh, when you're talking about like uh, protection of the guest, like from the host and such, uh, are you familiar with the uh, PKVM as well? The secret hiding thing? Yes. Yeah, so I think isn't PKVM for like confidential guests? Mm -hmm. And basically we want to do that, but for all VMs, not just uh, like confidential VMs. Oh, so you're doing this for like all VMs, not just, uh, yeah. I'll yeah, see. exactly. Yeah, I understand. Thank you. Uh, I'm curious, like when you have one kernel version that you just rebase on to, um, do you just have like one copy of the kernel for all the machines or do you like split them up like let's say for x86 you know you have one branch or another for ARM and so on? So uh, in like ideal world we don't have any separation so we try to keep like a homo homogeneous fleet but sometimes we have those situations where it's just like for example like yeah some platform like the upgrade went smooth 
no issues, nothing. We just deploy it as soon as possible. And for some time, there could be like a lag that some other architecture is still not updated. But we try to keep it homogeneous. Yeah. Great, thanks. Uh, so in a previous life, I had to do similar things to this um, <clears throat> with varying degrees of success. Uh, it wasn't necessarily um, technical. It was really management of the company versus what the upstream folks are saying. Um, I'm curious if you've run into that situation yet where if you posted something as an RFC upstream for a new feature and how you were planning to implement it for internal downstream stuff, gets completely wildly different feedback from the upstream maintainers. How do you guys, have you had to deal with that? How do you resolve that? Yeah, I mean, um, that is a constant kind of, yeah, like dance that we have to do because, yeah, like there are always internal deadlines that we have to meet. And yeah, that's why I'm saying upstream, like fully upstream first would probably not work for us because we, like it is very important for us to just uh, deploy something. So we need to find some combination where we, um, like do something downstream probably, but continue working uh, on getting something upstream. And as long as there is kind of a way at some point to go and switch to the upstream solution, it's fine because it's not like maintenance forever, right? Great, thanks. So a question about the process of cherry picking. The, and uh, using your local patches, so is it like git cherry pick or local git commit to your local branch based on the upstream or is it handled in a different way? Yeah, we just do git cherry pick if it's available in a, like sometimes, you know, if we're a bit like lagging in, in the doing in the minor update, we even cherry pick from like the stable branch on the same one. Uh, but yeah, it's just like git cherry picks and then basically when doing the rebases, uh, like you check whether that commit, uh, we also, yeah, would put like a commit hash from the actual uh, like branch in Linux. And then once you rebase on that, we just drop, right? Like once you find the commit hash in that branch, we drop the, the commit. And it, when you drop your uh, non-upstream patches, do you like git revert them or you will git rebase and interactive and drop them from the history or? Yeah, so for dropping it's, um, yeah, like one thing, we keep the, uh, the commits in git patches and then if you need to uh, apply them on a certain stable branch, you would say like apply these patches on this branch. So you could just remove that git patch, right, from the, uh, like, history, like from the directory that we keep it in and then it just won't be there. But for the one that we, like the branch that we're currently using to build the, uh, the kernel, yeah, you would do like a git revert. I cannot hear, sorry. Hello, uh, my question is regarding build uh, and configuration. Do you have different configurations for different binaries? Or you just have like one configuration that fits every machine you have in the fleet? Um, no, we use same configs, but I think depending dependent on the architecture, we may have something different. Uh, but yeah, we don't do like much of the kind of, yeah, it's, we try to stay homogeneous there as well because um, like it's easier to operate the fleet of like a giant size also when you have the same configs enabled. Hello? Test? Okay. Um, so you said you were using patches, not repositories. Are you using Quilt or are you using something else to manage a series? 
Uh, so we, I think we created, like in, initially it was just like a Python script that was doing it, but I think it's kind of similar to Quilt, yeah. I, I haven't used it like Quilt myself, but the one that we maintain internally, I think it probably does a similar thing. Okay, thanks. Uh, I was wondering, um, what you think about the, the, I would not say the risk, I would say the probability that a lot of uh, low criticity patches continue to accumulate because very commonly when we have local patches, they are simple patches that need, we need to quickly fix or improve production and that cannot wait uh, one or two uh, kernel release cycles to be approved and merged. So uh, don't you think it is possible that you will continue to see a lot of such uh, low importance patches continue to, to be stacked onto your uh, LTS kernels and uh, probably forgotten over time? Usually we, we already discover local patches during a rebase periods. Let's be honest, uh, if we all have uh, tens, uh, hundreds or thousands of local patches, we just detect them uh, during rebase because uh, we see a lot of them uh, scroll uh, during the rebase and, uh, and then we work just on the other ones which are causing trouble and we forget about the low important stuff in fact. Um, yeah. yeah, if I did I understand it correctly that you mean like if we keep having like those... Uh, I suspect that you will continue to uh, add some more. local patches for low important stuff that should theoretically be merged according to your uh, principles. They should be upstreamed, mm -hmm. but uh, they are never on the path of uh, upstreaming because uh, they are never blocking any rebase and uh, once they're done, they're done, you see? Yeah, I mean, ideally we wouldn't have any downstream patches. Yeah, and you know, once we like, for example, right, right, right now, how we tagged patches as like upstreamable or not is just we ask developers like whenever you touch a patch, just like assess whether like it makes zero sense to just keep it downstream. It's actually like a nice, mm -hmm. like a real issue that we, we should solve and like why did we even keep it downstream? Uh, but then some others were like developers uh, put a tag that it's not upstreamable. But you know, once we get rid of those that we actually or like not get rid, but right like find the path to like actually make them like into nice commits that we can merge upstream. Uh, then we will start like taking a hard look on the ones that don't. And yeah, we're trying to, you know, like here, I also agree on the stuff that like, even over, like, you know, as I'm doing this work, we actually still have people like adding downstream patches. Uh, so they're kind of like still, um, yeah, making my life, yeah, a bit harder. Uh, so we're trying to also change the process internally, right? Where all patches are upstream by default, and then you kind of have to really prove hard that uh, we can keep it downstream. I see. Thank you. Yeah, I think one more question. Uh, you, you kindly provided uh, a few tags to illustrate the, the proportions of the, the, the patches kind. Um, do you have any tooling around that? Maybe a tagging system? A, I don't know, something like Alfresco that manages the patches and the life cycle of, of the patches. Do you have some sugar like that? Yeah, so we don't have one for life cycle, but we want it. Um, this one, uh, yeah, I think a colleague of mine like wrote some also Python script to do this. But yeah, for like stuff like upstreamable, not upstreamable, maybe uh, that's, yeah, we just added a tag in the patch. Like basically, yeah, just like tag upstream status. Uh, and for upstream cherry picks, uh, you just try to like see if there is any hash in the commit message that, uh, yeah, like also you need to like uh, tag it properly, but it would also say, yeah, like this commit hash. And then the tool basically checks whether it exists in any upstream git branch. If by any chance it's open source somewhere. I mean, we should, yeah, there is also no reason to keep <laughs> this one downstream. Yeah, let me like actually get to the, like it's my teammate that, maintains the script, so yeah, I'll also reach out. Cool. Uh, 
thanks for your presentation. One question regarding the number of potentially up upstreamable patches, but that are still not upstream. Are you uh, afraid of the consequences security-wise of having so many patches that typically haven't been reviewed by a lot, lot of people but are running on production? Is it some some is the risk behind that uh, evaluated or? Yeah, I mean, 100% agree, right? That uh, this code uh, hasn't seen like more like experienced uh, more experienced eyes haven't like reviewed this code. Um, yeah, for I think for a lot of these features, we did have some kind of like internal security review before they were. Uh, and for like that's the normal process for any like platform or feature we. Um, launch, right, we have some security review and they try to do like fuzzing, different kinds of pen tests. Uh, but yeah, it's like we don't do it obviously like on every release cycle, right, on like maybe on major uh, kernel upgrades, but it's not, right, like if we're doing minor updates all the time, there could be some subtle things that could regress over time. So I agree on that, that uh, there is not just like maintenance burden of keeping stuff downstream, but also kind of uh, higher chance of having a security vulnerability that wouldn't have existed otherwise. Yeah. So I don't think that problem is any different than any enterprise distro today. Their, their patch loads are way bigger than this. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think yeah. I wh when I was pre like preparing for the presentation, I also heard that yeah, like sometimes people have to stay on really old kernels and then they like add a lot of stuff and then yeah, for like some systems there are way more patches. But I think um, yeah, because we're like a cloud provider, uh, there is also a big risk, like yeah, very high risk of like adding that um, yeah, like security avenue, <laughs> uh, security vulnerability avenue, and then also maintenance is fairly hard. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, like we're not the first to have downstream patches and probably will not be the last. Well, yeah, I think that that's all. Yeah, thank you very much again.